Today we have with us Katie Plum. Katie is a licensed social worker who specializes in brain spotting. Um, brain spotting is something I've really taken an interest in. Um, I've currently recently begun EMDR with my own therapist, and uh, brain spotting is it's a little more intense of a process, but it's uh, super interesting to me. So um, today we're going to talk with Katie a little bit about brain spotting, what it is, kind of what it consists of, and a little bit of her background and what got her interested in it herself. So you have such a charming accent. I <laughs> I've talked to a few different people lately. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, North Carolina. <laughs> that's so funny because i that's i never hear that <laughs> i i don't know if it's because i'm from dc so i got oh, yeah. a, some more southern than other because it's kind of more of a southern town than people realize yeah but i love yeah. the accent <laughs> I, you have such a charming accent i <laughs> i've talked to a few different people lately i'm like oh yeah that's right north carolina <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny because I that's I never hear that. <laughs> well, let's get started. <laughs> okay. So, um, so tell us a little bit about you, who you are, and what you currently do. All right. I am Katie Plum. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Long Beach, California, Artesia, California, and for an agency that is I think it's still located in LA, but um, most of the clinicians there work virtually. Okay. So in the in Artesia, I'm at an IOP PH or intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization program, and that's where I kind of run all the trauma stuff. Okay. And I'm also a clinical supervisor there, and then um, the BIPOC social justice agency that's in LA. I interned there when I was an associate and now I supervise for them, which is a really nice full circle. Hi. I love that agency so much. Um, and then I have a private practice in Long Beach on the weekends. Okay. So I'm so you're Saturdays right. are my day. Off. <laughs> I'm busy. You, yeah, you sound very busy. Um, well, I'm glad that you had the time to kind of fit me in. <laughs> Yeah, this is, I love my mornings. I always block those off to have time to do things I like. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so I am a brain spotter. Uh, or let me, I can back up. I'm from DC. Um, I moved out here in 2012 to finish my MSW that I had started back in DC. Um, and that came after a master's program in New York and they really complemented each other. The master's in New York was in clinical psychology, kind of a waste of, it was an expensive experiment to see if I wanted to research or work with people. <laughs> and then the MSW gave me the ability to get licensed to actually work with clients directly. Okay. Um, and then, like I mentioned, so for about 10 years, I've been working with trauma but it wasn't until 2020 that I got trained in brain spotting. And that came about after I had been looking for, I've had a therapist for quite a while, um, but I had been looking for deeper healing for complex PTSD, which she, she was the one to kindly, to finally convince me, like, this is what you have. This is what you need to get help with. And, um, a colleague of mine just said, have you heard about brain spotting? I had not at that point. Um, but I found this woman. She knocked out several traumas in the first three sessions. And when I say knocked out, like it is an intense session, mm -hmm. but then it's gone. It's freedom. You, you can hear about it. You can talk about it. It doesn't trigger anything like it used to really okay. yeah so i i had to get trained in it because i was i started referring all my clients to her because i was like i know of this curative modality it feels unethical for us to just keep talking about your trauma and doing like art and that da, da, da. um 
when I know there's something that you can do to really clear it. So I was losing clients. <laughs> I was like, I'll just get trained in it. And it's changed my practice immensely. It's been the biggest gift. Wow. So, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that, that really interested me in, you know, our conversation, um, because I had heard of EMDR and I had kind of, you know, was, was a little interested in that. And then, um, we started talking about brain spotting and, mm -hmm. you know, first I didn't really have like an idea of, of what it was really. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, I don't know, maybe like they did a scan and they see like spots on your brain or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, of course, everybody thinks they're in like an MRI machine for yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so it explains it's a weird name <laughs> yeah. the interesting word for me was pockets I was like oh like okay that in a weird way in a weird way makes a little bit more sense to me because like I, I know how the brain works and how trauma works and in your brain and things like that and so I was like oh it gave me kind of like a more a clearer visual of mm -hmm. what this was um so can you kind of explain to us what exactly, or, you know, as much as you can, the process of brain spotting? Because um, the way that you described it to me in our conversation was very clear and it, it really interested me a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. I love sparking the interest in this. Um, I use the word both. That's just what, when I was doing the training, was the analogy given. Mm -hmm. um, but pockets, I can see how that is the exact, that works <laughs> the same way. Um, so what I like about the conceptualization that's in brain spotting versus EMDR, um, EMDR is a bit more like a filing cabinet analogy, whereas we are the buried capsules. So the filing cabinet part is because in, EMDR, you're really doing the reprocessing of the memory and the messages that it taught you about yourself. Mm -hmm. So each trauma, so their findings go and all that, um, each trauma is accompanied by distortions, like let's say, um, I'm not, I'm unworthy mm -hmm. or I'm damaged. So those, because those messages came as a result of these traumatic experiences being misfiled, basically. So they're not put back into the storage that tells you this experience is gone. So you can change this narrative for yourself. Um, so it, it takes those memories and puts them away, basically. Brain spotting does something similar in that it's a reprocessing experience, but the foundation of brain spotting is in these capsules, it's not, it's kind of everything is pulled in. Mm. So we don't have to follow a path like you do in EMDR kind of yeah. where it's like, what was the, what's the cognition? What's the first memory of that? What is the most recent memory of that? Brain spotting because of the capsules that we're able to access can work on pre-verbal trauma, trauma you have no insight into, um, I had a client who only, and I don't want this to be triggering, but she had been, um, drugged and sodomized and she came to me, not, she had, her cousin had told her about it. She didn't have any connection to what actually happened to her, you know, cognitively. She was yeah. like, nothing was on at that time, but her body remembered it. And so what we did with brain spotting is release the body pain and that, that simultaneously released the trauma so that it wasn't going to connect. If she had another stressful experience or scary experience, it wasn't going to reignite this trauma that her brain had protected her from. Yeah. Right. So in those capsules, we have the memory themselves we have the tangled web of all those messages, like we target an EMDR, but we also have the body sensations. We have all the senses. We have the connection to um, everything else that felt related at the time. They get sucked into these capsules, tangled up, 
and embedded in the subcortex part of the brain, like the deepest regions of the brain. Part of why they can see that brain body connection so well is because some of the capsules literally push into the body by being located in the brain stem. So when we're talking about pre-verbal trauma, that, you know, maybe every time you hear somebody raise your voice, raise their voice, you get a tummy ache. That, and you have no memory of why that, what trauma gave you that stomach ache. Yeah. Um, but let's say you are an infant and your parents are not coming to you when you're crying because you have a dirty diaper and you're hungry. Instead of them coming to you, you see between the bars of your crib, a violent fight. Uh-huh. And that fight involves sight, sound, and total fear. However, you don't have the language that tells you this is scary and this is happening. And there's, there's no way at that age to put it in the proper filing system. Right. Right. So when you are older, like I was saying, if somebody, let's say somebody is raising their voice at you, that same circuitry that built back when the experience of the dirty diaper and the hunger fired together one synapse. And then it got wired with this experience of the fear. So every time, fast forward to your 30, someone raises their voice at you, you are going to get those gastrointestinal issues. So it works both ways. So you can go in and clear verbal trauma. You can uh, release messages. So there's people who don't really process as much in the body during brain spotting. But then there's people who process entirely in the body. Like I had a client who was just saying, like she didn't know what was happening to her other than that her stomach to her throat felt like an elevator going up and down, up and down. So you just say, okay, let's go with that. We'll see where that goes. And in just kind of observing mindfully that process, the roller coaster ride of living with an alcoholic abusive dad released its hold on her. Yeah. So it just is really, it's, I don't want to, you know, use hyperbole. It's just a miraculous modality that was discovered. And it was actually discovered by a a master EMDR therapist. And in that process, he was working with, and this is David Grand. So it's a relatively new therapy. 2003 is when he discovered it. And he had been working for about a year with a figure skater who could not complete like the simple jump all of a sudden I think it's called the yips uh, like she lost mm-hmm. simple athletic abilities so with EMDR he was doing the bilateral eye movements uh-huh. and if your listeners know anything about EMDR it's about the movement yeah. the eye movement so he was doing that and when he was going back and forth he started to notice that let's say it was right here her eyes would wobble So she's tracking back and forth, looking at his fingers, but there was one spot that every time he passed it, her eyes would blink and wobble. Hmm. So he instinctively was like, okay, let's see what's going on here. Hold your gaze there. And this torrent of of material, like traumatic material that they thought they had processed came out. They, you know, in his ability to attune to clients and work with trauma, it, he helped guide her through that process of mindfully witnessing. And the next day, all of her athletic abilities were back. So it, it just, yeah. So he, at that point was like, this is, this is something. And in fact, when I was doing the EMDR training this weekend, my partner, every time we would pause the bilateral, his eyes went to one position. And he would go more in depth with what he was um, experiencing in that moment. And it was so hard for me in the training just to be like, keep moving your eyes. <laughs> so I'm like, there's your brain spot. Let's work on it. But I mean, they both have their place. They're just, they're very similar, but also pretty different. Yeah. Yeah. I, I cause I've noticed, um, uh, sorry. I, if my eyes keep, 
my daughter no that's okay currently kind of having a little panic attack that i'm trying to talk her through as well but i am paying attention um okay <laughs> uh so which which her i've i've actually you know it, it's it's funny funny not i don't know weird funny you know you're not supposed to like counsel people who you know your your spouse your kids you're not supposed to counsel people that you're close to right um she is in therapy but there's gaps in her therapy because of availability of of the therapist Mm -hmm. Um, but i was recently talking to her about exploring um emdr or brain spotting probably more so emdr for her um but we were talking about it recently um she's only 16 though so i don't know you know how that plays a part um how old you have to be or you know because certain things you can brain spot you can brain spot teeny tiny kids really years old yeah um Mm -hmm. there's modifications we make for the younger ones right um some of them are just simple like we break up the time more we may have a parent sitting with them so they have that resource spot like sitting on their lap or something um we incorporate a little bit more play therapy sometimes sand tray um all the way down to like our our wand might have a funny character on it that is resourcing to the kid so okay it's you know, with modifications, it's the exact same process. Like a two-year-old that has developmental trauma, even if it was in utero, is going to have some of the symptoms of that. And then we can take care of those. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. One thing teenagers tend to like about uh brain spotting is that you can talk or not talk. So Uh they are able, you know, you I do a little bit of training each session and what mindfulness is and kind of guide them on how to mindfully witness their inner experience. And from there, they can tell me everything they're seeing. If I notice they're in the story, like they're thinking about it too much, I might guide them back into the body. Um, Because when we're analyzing or trying to figure out, we are in the neocortex. And that is what we're trying to bypass with brain spotting because the neocortex says, I can figure it out. I know all this and is really intellectual and analytical. Yeah. But that's actually, that has nothing to do with trauma healing, Mm -hmm. you know, and those talk therapies like cognitive processing that are about desensitization. um, And again, like restoring the memories, it just, it, it neglects everything below the neocortex you know yeah. um so i was i was going somewhere with that wasn't i <laughs> look you're my kind of people because <laughs> all <the> time, so <laughs> it's all good <laughs> okay <laughs> so <laughs> so um you know I, it's the process it it is interesting to me in in certain ways because one of them being I have kind of, I have kind of like full memories of certain things, right? And then I have mm-hmm. kind of selective, then I have like still shots. Um, and mm-hmm. and I was talking to my therapist uh, and, you know, when we started doing the EMDR, before we started doing it, we were talking to, and I was like, you know, I know this isn't realistic, right? But I feel like, certain things happened so long ago that they shouldn't still affect me you know this this is my like human brain my not Mm. my psychology background you know nothing just me being like this stuff shouldn't you know like I'm in a healthy relationship I understand why certain things affected my previous relationships and you know I'm in a healthy one now. We're good and, and all these things. And I, I'm a much better parent than I used to be. And the things that are important to me, I'm like, no, but like those things are good. So why is these, how could it, and why should it still affect me? You know, kind of thing. And, and it's like, 
because it's there <laughs> you know mm-hmm. like things can yeah. be fantastic and, and it's also why too sorry um it, it's also it, there there's a, a connection between our brain chemistry which i feel a lot of times we kind of fail we kind of neglect science you know like yeah yeah we have chemicals in our brain our brain is you know does this and our brain tells us <laughs> what to do and, you know our brain doesn't always feel logical right because mm-hmm. our, our visual connected with our emotional our mental doesn't necessarily always feel like it's that it it adds up you know otherwise mm-hmm. everything will make sense all of the time you know yeah and and even with I mean I have a master's degree in psychology and I still am affected by things that happened to me so long ago and I still yeah. feel like why did why should that still affect me well if I put my hat on you know and mm-hmm. I think logically because it's still there so as long as it's still there it's going to affect us in ways that we may or may not even realize and and a lot of it I only realize that it affects me after I got my education and you know I learned certain things the only reason I even know is because of education and life experience but Mm -hmm. if you're someone who doesn't have education in certain fields or you haven't you know for whatever be able to understand certain things or you know learn about certain things you're definitely not going to understand like you're it's definitely not going to make sense to you you know if it if it doesn't yeah if our brains don't connect it when we have the education it's unfair to yourself without the education to feel like you should just have it together Of course. Yeah. And it's worth talking about like what trigger means, you know, we hear it so much right now um, in the TikTok era, you know, and what triggered was originally referring to is these capsules. So while it wasn't conceptualized as the capsules, um, it it is that process of something knocking on the capsule door and bits of that intolerable feeling come out and the brain wants to protect you again, wrapping it back up and in, in further embedding the capsule. Yeah. Yep. When, when you are, you know, let's say part of your trauma was during this vague period around age or you kind of remember you weren't in school yet kind of vaguely know something was up like something was bad at this point and one day you walk outside and your neighbor is cutting the grass and that smell of the grass you don't know why or what it's taking you to it takes you to a feeling of unsafety right yeah so that's one example of like a trigger you know something is triggering that capsule so when we have, you know, not just pre-verbal, but, and I don't, I didn't know if we were going to go into my history at all, but. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I had what you're talking about, this flashbulb memories mm-hmm. of being about four to, I know it ended when I was seven, um, you know, a various experiences of a sexual trauma not within my family Mm -hmm. and the experience or the what that like let's say the cognition if we were doing emdr what that told me for many years was i am dirty and unworthy Mm -hmm. i am defective i am damaged somebody saw that i was vulnerable i'm not going to put it in the mean way that i would say to myself but kind of like you get what you deserve they saw that you were a little whatever um so within that when I did the brain spotting kind of around that 
it was interesting because my um my brain spotter I use parts therapy with it too and that's one of the great things about brain spotting is you can integrate a lot of different therapies within it and my therapist helped me walk through um both that child part coming forward that little girl that held all the damage and dirtiness and then an older part of myself that had also been traumatized but in a previous session had been released so that now released of trauma part of myself was able to come into my you know whether you call it your brain your field of awareness um and take care of that quote unquote damaged little girl yeah so it's and within that my body sensations a lot of my tendency to dissociate um a lot of my feelings of just sickness and distrust around men um that really healed because there was a part of me that was saying you don't have to live here anymore yeah. and was able to take that little part of myself out of those memories and some of the memories I didn't even have until the brain spotting got underway so that's not necessarily the point of brain spotting to pull up memories but you often do get more insight during the process you know, the mine is, is very similar, um, but more than one person. Um, mm -hmm. It's, again, I don't want to say like, like funny, you know, but it's, it's the feelings that we feel as kids, right? Like these are natural, unbiased, unfiltered, mm -hmm. like feelings. Um, we're not old enough to tell ourselves yet that <clears throat> that um, we shouldn't feel this way or or we're wrong for feeling this way or we should have this or that, you know. Um, but what do people around us do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm 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 <laughs> trying not to like uh, wrap up what she's saying and and what you're saying, but as adults adults and really I guess teenagers too because as a teenager you're not a, a unfiltered kid anymore you kind of taking in the world around you and you're trying to impress certain people and and you know things like that but the 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 point that I really wanted to make is that as adults we try to base our feelings and our reactions around what's acceptable uh mm -hmm you know, what we think we're supposed to do. And even though you're not that kid anymore, to, you know, to you, who, who, who everybody who's listening, um, even though you're not that, kid, <laughs> the kid with the unfiltered, the raw emotion, what you're feeling is still valid. Yeah, um, it's all linked a big thing I think with trauma is validity and feelings uh trauma causes certain feelings that we we don't want to feel right or that you know we're not we're not supposed to react to a certain way well I'm a mm -hmm. grown up I should blah 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 it's not true <laughs> You're a grown but up. look at that look at the so yeah I think a lot of that has to do with so I'm sorry to back up. Both of my <laughs> parents had experienced a bunch of trauma as kids. Uh -huh. And I do believe some of my, the way my body holds trauma has to do with that intergenerational, like the epigenetics, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but had they been better equipped within, like had they experienced healing of their past, they would have been better equipped to meet my attachment needs, right? My mom was extremely anxiously attached, very preoccupied. My dad was classically avoidant. Um, and they didn't have the ability to parent me the way I know they wanted to. Right. Yeah. Had I been safe to be able to go, hey, the neighbors are doing this to me. I don't even, you know, I don't know remember if I thought it was wrong. You know, they were, they took care of us all the time. Yeah. Um, 
But had I been able to go to my parents and say, this is happening and have them meet what I needed in that moment, which was of course, safety, what you're talking about, validation, yeah. um, like protect your body. This isn't right. Had I been able to do that, it wouldn't necessarily have gotten embedded. Like not all traumas right. get unprocessed. Right. So if a kid wins the lottery and has parents that are so attuned and so with them and they don't have attachment trauma, that kid's going to have resiliency to not bury those terrible, terrible feelings. Yeah. So when, and in the case of complex PTSD, those neural networks tend to both beget more traumas, you know, because if you're walking around with this I have a fuck me sign on, sorry, um, on my Please. forehead. That I've been holding back your phone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, you walk around with like, somebody can see something in me and I'm not, I'm bad. So that kind of, that definitely did shape some of my behavior. And then when I was, so my dad died when I was 14. And then two years later I was raped. So that, where I was when I was raped, if that had happened in isolation, the context of it and everything, I don't think my life would have taken the veer off course necessarily that it did. I don't know. Yeah. But I know it tied in so much to what I had experienced before and what I, um, yeah, what I experienced before and what I knew to be you know, quote unquote, knew to be true about myself, right. it all fell into line and just confirmed the fact that, you know, you, you don't even deserve to live. And chronic suicidality is a big part of CPTSD. You see it what people are less likely to make the gestures of suicide, but they're going to feel very detached from life and motivated to make life better or plan for the future or, um, yeah, just know how to take care of themselves. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> was so in the on the topic of sexual assault, and and I'll you know make sure to put trigger warnings and things like that. Um, in the beginning, mm -hmm. so I need to make sure. I, um, but <clears throat> it's it's one thing that has really affected me a lot that I didn't even I mean I mean like there was a point in my life where I was like this has definitely not affected me like I would convince myself mm -hmm. right that like oh I decided <laughs> I very clearly made a decision after my best friend at my new school shamed me slut shamed me um and then my boyfriend at the time when I finally confessed to him and said can we just take a break in sex it's really triggering me yeah um he broke up with me so those two messages, and, you know, I'd been so devastated by my dad's death. I just, I consciously was like, oh, I'm going to wrap this up and never talk about it again. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to think about it because it's just going to make things worse. You yeah. know, nobody wants to hear about it. And it, you know, that is actually what made things worse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I went, I went, so when I was writing my autobiography, I went through this kind of phase of that too like <clears throat> okay well and, and even after because I'm like okay I'm putting this book out here people are going to read it I'm going to have to talk about it like yeah. but do I really need to keep talking about it because it, it's in the past and blah blah, blah. I don't want to like oh like look at me I went through this I, I had that mm -hmm. whole you know thing but I've learned and, and the more too that I you know, focus on the podcast and, and certain things, there's certain things that I want to get involved in involving the sexual assault victims that I've learned, like, yeah, talking about it is, it's okay. Like, it's not me saying, oh, look at me. I went through this, but either way I went through it. So if I talk about it, if I want to talk about it, or if I want to use it to help other people, or if I don't, and I just want to talk about it, to someone I trust that's fine too you know like yeah. it, it it's it's okay to talk about our traumas in a way that you know is going to help someone else so whether it be on the podcast or you know or providing therapy you know it, it's okay it, 
don't yeah. feel like because you went through something, you have to hide that and be ashamed of it. If you want to talk about it, talk about it, it and and try to help people with it. Mm -hmm. There's some things I, I love talk therapy. It's not like I only do brain spotting yeah. because there's something so powerful about being able to tell your story to a caring, supportive, attuned, an unbiased individual like a like yeah. a therapist. Yeah. And it's very relieving yeah. and it can put your narrative into a context. It can help you make new meanings. So it is really important to have that ability to um ventilate when you need to. Yeah. You know, if it's like sharing your story for the first time or if it's just like, please, please remind me that I'm okay. You know, there's it all has a place in trauma therapy. Um, uh, so I didn't go into what a session looks like. I could kind of talk about that. I was like, I, I did the thing too, where I just forgot, like I, where I was like, <laughs> yes, let's talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I'll just going to walk through what it looks like beginning to end. Um, but you know, I'll just say a brief version. So with the fixed eye position, that's our channel to go in and find the brain spots. When we start a session, well, first, let me back up. First, I do an intake process. You're kind of standing, what's brain therapy, da -da. If they are endorsing trauma symptoms, I tell them about brain spotting and ask if they would like to do a special assessment so we can identify targets that way. So I we go through a checklist of traumas and then it also includes problematic symptoms and behaviors one may be struggling with. So it's not just, you don't have to go in knowing a trauma. You could be like, I have chronic stomach aches or I get mad so easily. You know, all of those are channels inward. So yeah. when we isolate, when we decide on the targets, we then rate the intensity of the disturbance or activation uh, on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the worst you've ever felt about anything. Um, and then the more activated you are, it's like it lights up the switchboard of the brain. So it's easier to find those brain spots. So that process is kind of uncomfortable for people who have a specific idea of what therapy should be yeah. because it's like, I'm asking really pointed questions. Like what is the worst part about it? Freeze there. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a trauma memory or it's a body sensation, like tension in your chest and I'm like, okay, hold your attention there. Nobody wants to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't feel good. Like, I want to keep it. I want to keep it. <laughs> yeah. But so that's that old saying, like, you have to feel it to heal it. Um, we encourage clients to do that final push, you know, that you survive this in real life. Your brain needs to discharge it. So you're going to get some of those symptoms in this session. So you know, and you might have different memories come up, different messages. Um, but if we do that final push to discharge the capsule throughout the session, you're going to be on this roller coaster where, um, let's say, grief over a lost childhood, feelings of being damaged, all of that. Um, when that is releasing, it gets replaced by something like, uh, I remember I did one on my mom's uh, mental health and it just shifted everything for me. I had, she had been, it was like, I was trying to help her swim and she just kept strangling me on accident, oh. um, bringing me down with her for my whole thirties. And I, that feeling of, I am drowning and I'm going down with her was a palpable feeling that I didn't even know I was holding in my throat. So they released the feeling in my throat. And then within that, it didn't make me feel distant from my mom or want to reject her. It made me see her as a broken 
individual who tried her best and I am so grateful for her. Oh. I never, have, I'm, I'm actually about to tear up because she just died, but um, yeah, I never could have forgiven her. I never could have had her in my life. I moved her out here. Um, I, it was just such a gift that I was able to have those last couple of years with her yeah. um, in a different yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so they do that. You go through like all the feelings, all the sensations, all the um, messages, and then you have freedom. So when we're doing it, there's, I think I mentioned, yeah, at the beginning, we don't do protocols, we do setups. So if a client, for example, is very somatically attuned, like can tell you what is happening in their body, um, we might do something called inside window. And that is where, let me see, let me see if I can show you. So if we have this wand, we would go, hold your vision over here to the left. While you look at my wand point, look in the center, look to the right. And we hold it for like 10 seconds. If a person is somatically attuned, they're going to be able to tell me, oh, it feels stronger over here. Mm. Or I can tell as you're getting over in this direction, my heartbeat is going up. If a person is very disconnected, however, there's a setup that we go in where the therapist is just finding the brain spots. So as opposed to the client saying, stop here, I'm going to stop when I see the reflexes. Reflexes are those eye wobbles, blinking, swallowing, a sudden deep breath. Um, hmm. Some people re report just, you know, like my hands are tingling now um, once we get on the brain spot. So it just depends on level of insight and ability to um, tune in with oneself. But that point being like, the point being that, um, yeah, there's just a way, there's a way for everybody. Um, there are additional setups to, for people who are very fragile or dissociative. Like if you have um, DID or even just tend to blank out. Those setups, like we have, a, there's one called the triple resource, advanced resource model where you find the eye position like on the horizontal axis uh -huh. then you go up and down on the y-axis to find you know is it here is it here is it here and from there if this is a, again a very fragile client i would have them cover one eye and then cover the other eye and I'm going to put an eye patch on them for whatever eye was most activated. So that's the one we close. If it's too intense, we cover up that eye. And then what we do is called Z axis, where I ask them, look at the pointer where we had it fixed. Now look at the tip of the pointer and now flex your eyes just a little bit. So it's like you're looking straight through the pointer to the furthest point in the wall. Okay. Yeah. One of those distances is going to feel more resourceful. Oh. So for people with insecure attachment, looking at the wall, like insecure, anxious attachment, looking through the pointer to the wall uh -huh. is generally the most activating. So we ask them, just keep your eyes on the pointer. For people who have more avoidant attachment, a lot of times the pointer being up close feels intrusive. So they look further back. Okay. Okay. And that's the one thing that I, what I was saying, like, I like so much more than EMDR is you can start as early as the first session because we have ways to slow it down and let the body heal itself in a safe container that we don't need to instill externally. Okay. Uh, so the, once we find the position, regardless of what setup we use, the client's only job, and this is kind of the hard part, is not to do anything they just have to mindfully witness and so I'm sure most people by now know a lot about mindfulness but it's that process of just kind of paying attention by stepping back and observing without judgment or pushing anything away 
So sometimes I give the example of, imagine you are the sky. The sky is a container for the weather, but it knows it is not the weather. Mm -hmm. So all of those clouds that are going to come by or the storms or the, you know, that is your experience and you're going to watch it. You don't have, you're not the clouds. You're not getting caught up in the storm. You are stepping back and saying, whoa, whoa, this is what my brain needs me to see right now. Yeah. Um, it is, that's the buy-in part that can be difficult for some mm -hmm. clients. Um, I, I feel and like it's, it makes, sorry, go on. I'm sorry. I, I feel like we always want to do something, right? Like, I want to go yeah. into this and I want to fix everything now. And I want to, I want progress and I want to, so it, it, I can imagine that for a lot of people, it's difficult to just like allow the process to be the process <laughs> because we teenagers always especially take a little bit more. Um, I'm working with a couple of adolescents right now who, is, yeah, they will ask so many times, I don't know what I'm doing. Am I doing this right? And there's, it's, there's really no answer to that other than, yeah, just trust yourself, trust the process. Yeah. Your brain knows what to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, after that roller coaster ride, if activation is still high, I'll either go into a purely resource spot. So we're not processing anymore on pain. We're going to go in and expand on something pleasant. Are helpful so we've excavated the trauma in that session and then we go in and we anchor what do you want to feel instead mm -hmm. i want to feel hopeful so we find a spark of hope in the body and then we expand it so in that way even if a client's like trauma processing too hard for me today well let's do some expansion to help you reach a positive goal so there's always something worthwhile to do with brain spotting so, because I feel like a lot of people probably would assume that, oh, this process is just going to be intense. Like, it's just this intense process. Yes. And, you know, so to know that there are things that can be done and are done during sessions to, mm -hmm. to kind of break that intensity, I think that's pretty important too, because, yeah, <clears throat> you know, if I didn't know anything about either one, I, I can imagine going, not wanting to go in because that sounds really hard, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, I, my brain spotting group <laughs> has such a reputation of like, you're up and it's, it's really not that bad. It's just that it's more productive than other groups. So it does feel like you're, it's more intense. Um, but then once people actually do it and they kind of see oh, this is in the service of my healing and I can trust myself that my body is going to do what it needs to do and I don't have to kind of control the process. Yeah, yeah. It's just so healing. Um, I'm a big, like, I like feelings. I, that's an understatement. I love feelings. I love feeling alive now. I love intensity of experience. You know, I'm a novelty seeker, all that. Um, when I do brain spotting, I, I feel like I could just eat popcorn and watch a movie. <laughs> it's just so amazing when I'm like, whoa, yes. I didn't even know that was connected. You know, I'm just a very curious, excited person for this. So yeah, um, my, my healing goes pretty quick. I have clients who are um, really, really like I have a Reiki practitioner for processing goes like that because really? she knows how to just calmly sit in the discomfort and let it move through her hmm. so people with a mindfulness practice a meditation practice body work um they tend to be like our super processors in terms of speed and intensity because okay. mindfulness is really the key yeah that we have to look for okay yeah. makes sense yeah <laughs> um uh, and then yeah we rate the suds I don't know if I said what that, the zero to one to 10 scale yeah. um, for distress. So we rate the suds at the end. If it still hasn't gone down, I'll do some grounding and containment then. But it's really unusual that we need to. 
And one of the coolest things about it is you're processing for 72 hours afterwards. So if we get that like really difficult, painful part out, you are still making new synapses and still rewriting your messages mm -hmm. for up to 72 hours. And that's why it's really important. I like doing it at the IOP because they are there sober. Um, yeah. When you interrupt that 72 hours by smoking weed, for example, it it just kind of stunts how much yeah. deeper you can go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting to know too, because it's, <clears throat> as we know, healing is a process, but mm -hmm. you know, just with, just like with, um, recovery and, and, you know, it's a, it's a consistent process. And, and I know that this is something that you can't just, or correct me if I'm wrong, but not something you can just go do one time and say, okay, I'm, I'm fit. I'm fixed, you know, kind of thing. Well, it depends on the complexity of the trauma and the network. Mm -hmm. um, I had a client who came in after being T-boned and I'm sure if we, if they had wanted to do more than the terror about the car accident, yeah. we could have dug in and found some childhood stuff. Um, or more childhood stuff than we found, you know, but yeah. what it was, somebody put their life in danger and they weren't able to help the person that they were driving. So um, they had this responsibility feeling, even though, you know, this car almost took their life. Yeah. So in that session, we cleared it out. They were okay to drive after that. They hadn't been driving. Um, okay. And so for them, they were like, that was my goal coming in here. We did one session. It was okay. great. They um, uh, it comes up again, but yeah. um, the simpler or single incident traumas, I don't want to minimize them by calling them simpler, right. but right. when there's not that yeah. huge tangle of life experiences around right. it, it is like a one and done. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. That's helpful to know too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, shit i had a <laughs> i had a <laughs> oh i i wanted to also to and we'll wrap up in here in just a minute but i wanted to point out too that when when we refer to trauma we don't just mean it doesn't just have to be sexual trauma it doesn't no. just have to be you know it could be physical mental emotional it, it doesn't just have to be sexual all right um, it could be childhood Do you know you know it can one of the a trauma that I hadn't even considered until I read this excellent book, um, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Um, there was one in there about overindulgence, like spoiling as a child. Mm. And when I was first reading that, I was like, how is that trauma? Yeah. But when you think about it, how unprepared are you for the world if you have been overindulged your whole life? you are walking out into the world essentially unprotected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, yeah, you, to your point, like so much, it just, it depends on how one experiences it. And, and two, that like, you know, just because we experience trauma from childhood doesn't mean we're blaming everything on our parents. It doesn't mean that our parents were no. people, you know, your parents can be with amazing people with the best of intentions. Nobody's perfect. Right. Like no. I've had, I've held myself accountable for things that have happened to and around my kids and I wasn't there. And mm. I felt like I was the worst parent because this happened to my child you know, and, and yeah. that's not the case because I wasn't there and I didn't do it to them. However, you know, it's that feeling I'm responsible for this person yeah. and that still happened to them, you know? So I, I think that's kind of important to point out to, um, just because someone calls you trauma, even unintentionally, even intentionally, we're all imperfect people you know, mm -hmm. and, and it, now, if that person was a bad person, they were a bad person, but you know, yeah. it, 
things happen in life sometimes, uh, uh, most of the time, a large portion of the time that are out of our control. Um, and yeah. I'm speaking more so to parents, like just because things happen to your children that you didn't directly do, it, it doesn't make you a bad person. You know, yeah. maybe speaking yeah. a little to myself, but to other people too who are listening. Well, that feeling of internalized, yeah, that internalized shame you were feeling, yeah. that's a brain spotting target. We can yeah. release that. And then, you know, not to say this is your case, but um, for some people with that guilt and shame around, I am not a good enough parent. Well, it influences in some regards the way we interact with people. If we can heal that cognition of shame and I'm not a good parent, um, it tends to free people up to parent the way they actually want to. Um, I think about forgiveness a lot. There were things, there were things with my parents and other relationships where, I mean, even as a therapist, I was kind of like, you don't have to forgive. That's not part of it. And you never want to impose that on somebody like you need to forgive this person. Yeah. But in the process of brain spotting, like that session with my mom or sessions about my dad, um, it naturally occurred because I got to go through all the pain. I re-experienced like those feelings of being small and I'm not taken care of. But then on the other side of that was exactly what you were talking about. Like, wow, these imperfect people brought me into the world and did their best. Yeah. And yeah. it's, I don't care about letting somebody off the hook. That's not why we forgive what it did. It's like burst open my chest with how much love I'm able to feel outside those rooms Mm -hmm. you know the therapy room like being able to forgive and see how much I truly am grateful for my parents for all their flaws like I am so much better able to love in other aspects of my life now so that's like the most beautiful thing for me because you're not just getting rid of the trauma you're just truly expanding into who you always deserve to be yeah yeah I, I I with my father I spent a lot of time kind of, I'd, I'd go around him and then I'd stay away for a while just because I had this kind of image in my head and, and I didn't want to see the, the, the alcohol, like the, you know, the mm-hmm. different things. Um, so I stayed away. Um, yeah. there was one point where I just kind of went back and said, you know what, I'm going to let all that go because I'm literally just hurting myself, harboring all this hate. Mm-hmm. And when I'm around him, he doesn't, do anything harmful to me you know Mm -hmm. I I was angry because he had hurt my sister he had you know done these things but I had to kind of realize like I'm only hurting myself more by holding that in and and it does hinder your other relationships absolutely yeah um and then to you know so so being able to forgive someone because because you know the act of forgiving them but also because the act of freeing yourself uh you don't even need to tell anybody you forgive them yeah, it's for your yeah, own just, freedom you know it, it's over it's done and and i'm okay you know um yeah. and, and even with yourself as a parent too uh because i know for a fact that sometimes say in my own personal experience i went through something as a child and I said, I would never let that happen to any of my kids. And damned if it didn't happen to one of my kids. Luckily, yeah. it's not the same degree, mm-hmm. but it still happened. And But of course, that's going to trigger your stuff. Yeah. I I mean, I, I, I spent time really like hating myself because it's like, this happened to you and then you let it happen to them like no but I wasn't even there you know like kind of what I was saying earlier like we can't control every little thing that happens and you know but it but it is it's like like I said again speaking from kind of personal experience my thought process well I allowed this person into our lives I allowed this person into our home I allowed this person to to be friends with with my older kid and so really mm-hmm. it is kind of my fault because I let this person be around. 
but not because I didn't know they were going to do that or I wouldn't let them around, you know, of course. kind of thing, but, but, but that's a natural process. You know? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I felt very angry with my parents for quote unquote, letting it happen. They didn't know though. Yeah. They didn't, they, they would have killed them had they known. You yeah. know, I just, I didn't have the equipment within me to talk about it and yeah. they didn't have the equipment to pick up on it. Yeah. There, there was something that happened when I was really little and I didn't even realize I remembered it until one day I was like probably in my twenties and I asked my mom, I was like, Hey, did so-and-so happen? And she was like, like, how do you know that? And I was mm-hmm. like, well, I don't know. I just, I just had this like picture come up in my head and she yeah. was like, I like you were so little I didn't think you would remember that and all this and I'm like it all gets stored somewhere like my my reaction initially was like you knew like you didn't call the police you didn't do this you didn't kill them to hide their body like you know like yeah so angry yeah and then you know I'm, I'm looking back and I'm like well shit like I'm a parent too and when this happened with this person, I did go to the police, but I didn't kill them and hide their body. So I can't hold that against her that she didn't do that too, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, she was like, well, this is what I did. And that, you know, I, I addressed the problem and no, I didn't go to the police, but we, you know, we took care of it this way and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but he could have done it again. Like, I don't know. He could not have, I don't know. And it, and it's yeah. really not for me to sit here and dwell on because it literally doesn't change anything you know like yeah. it doesn't change anything yeah. you know, being upset with her and she didn't even do it I think that's it's illogical as natural as a thought as it is you know but trumpering is the last thing the furthest from logical right 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it helped us survive all these cognitions all these behaviors yeah it was all survival yeah well (laughs) (laughs) on that note (laughs) on that note i have to wrap i really have could just sit here and talk to you for like so i have to go pick up my kids (laughs) but okay yeah i've got to go eat lunch and and get a couple other things done but I, I'm, I'm really glad we had this conversation and and um I hope that we can have more um I'd, I'd love to you know talk more um let us know where we can find you on social media or a website however people can reach you um my website is katie plum k-a-t-i-e p-l-u-m-b dash lcsw.com if you have any therapists um pre-licensed student or licensed so that's holistic therapist retreats dot com um, and we're doing group brain spotting we're doing reiki we're there's going to be a lot of really cool uh, modalities that they're going to get exposed to. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I want to point out to, <clears throat> excuse me, therapists need therapists. So if you are someone who works in the mental health field, you need somebody to talk to as well, <laughs> you know? Um, sure do. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah, know. vicarious trauma is a very real thing. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, don't ever feel like, you know, whatever for, for reaching out to someone. Well, I work in this field, so I shouldn't. No, no. Just like normal people need someone to talk to, and mental health workers need someone to talk to, too, because how else are you going to process all the things that people bring mm-hmm. to you? So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yep so burnout is so common in the field so i'm hoping we get some people that can use some healing themselves yeah and i have uh i had a friend he practiced reiki <clears throat> excuse me for a while 
and uh so it it it's really interesting that's really interesting to me too we have a reiki gal at the iop and she often i arrange my sessions mm -hmm. to be right before hers with clients if they like that because everything mm -hmm. just gets pushed out further it just kind of enhances the process yeah oh that's yeah. cool but that's about it. it's so harmonious with so many different approaches yeah you don't have to give up your favorite modalities to be able to use brain spotting gotcha okay but let me know i'll send you i'll send you the two women that i found okay um i'll just text you their info okay perfect mm. all right well thank you for being here and i will talk to you again soon yeah thanks for having me this was fun oh <laughs> i didn't see the